It's my great pleasure to welcome you to this session, which is looking at one of the really critically important issues in quality, which is often neglected, uh, and that's about um, human resources uh, and how we can use quality improvement science and quality improvement methodologies um, to work more effectively with the people within the systems with which we work. And we've got two great people who are going to give you their thoughts and ideas and indeed experiences of uh, what works in this area and where they've been in this area. I'm actually going to start off by just giving you a very brief overview of the human resources crisis. You know, what's the big human resources, what are the big human resources issues uh, in the world today? We're then going to turn uh, to Lauren Kreigler, who's going, who is a senior advisor for human resources uh, for initiatives and is seconded to the healthcare improvement programme. And Lauren comes to that with a background in HR. Uh, in the private sector, where she was the HR director of a private company, uh, but also with long experience of working in Africa, working and living in Africa in development, uh, but also in Latin America and also in Asia. So a wealth of experience that she's going to, that will be the background to what she's got to say to us. Uh, and then after her, uh, Kedar Marte will be talking to us. He works for IHI. He's a doctor who works partly for IHI and partly at Cornell, uh, and has been responsible for. Uh, much of IHI's work in South Africa. So again, he's going to be bringing in some of IHI's work, I think primarily in Africa. So quick presentation from me, slightly longer presentations from my two colleagues, and that gives us not very much time for questions and answers. Um, and what we're going to do there, and, and let me just prime you for that, is we know there are people in the room who've got real experience of this area. And what we'd like you to do is to share with us, but only in sort of one or two sentences, your ideas or thoughts about the intersection between uh, quality improvement uh, and quality improvement science and techniques and approaches and human resources issues. Um, so we like that to what the question and answer session at the end uh, to focus on. Uh, as always in, in any of these topics, and I guess probably more so in human resources than in others, uh, there's a whole wealth of areas to explore. Um, and say, I'll try and pace, uh, paint out the big picture, uh, and then we'll try and focus in on, on the particular intersection between uh, QI and HR. OK, I'm assuming everyone can hear me, but by the fact that nobody's waving at me from the back, so obviously the sound system's working. So let me start off, then, by trying to give you a, a biggish picture of the human resources crisis in the world at the moment. And let me be clear that whilst we are going to be talking, or my colleagues are going to be talking mostly about low- and middle-income countries, this is a global crisis. It's not one we in rich America or rich um, uh, Europe can avoid. The problems and indeed the solutions to it are in all parts of the world and need to be brought together. And let me make just one very simple point, that if you happen to be working in America or in Europe at the moment, you know that 65% of your uh, costs in your health system are in human resources. Uh, and you may well ask whether or not an, as much attention is given to the management and the development and the change in those areas uh, as might be, given how big a part of the budget and how big a part of the system people are. But turning to the crisis, the first point about it is the WHO in 2006 estimated that there was a shortfall of 4.3 million health workers in the world, with the biggest crisis in southern Sahara, in, in, uh, sub-Saharan Africa, where roughly 1.5 million health workers were missing. There were, at that point, there were about 1.7 million health workers in sub-Saharan Africa, and there needed to be another 1.5 to bring sub-Saharan Africa up to a very basic level of health care reaching everybody. And the measure for that was that 80% uh, of women had... There was enough staff to make sure that 80% of women had an attended delivery. So not a standard we would recognise in, in, in the UK or, or the US or Europe. So a pretty basic standard. So very big gap to be filled. Why is there that crisis? Well, there's a series of reasons. Let me pick out the one which always gets the biggest highest profile, which is migration. Um, people being trained in, in low- and middle-income countries and coming across to, to Holland or to France or to the UK or to America or, or wherever. Now, that is a big issue. Um, and if you look at the statistics, uh, in the last 35 years, the best estimate is that 135,000 health workers have emigrated from sub-Saharan Africa to, uh, the, uh, to the rest of the world. 
That's a very, very big number, but you'll observe, of course, that it's less than 10% of the shortfall. So if every African went home, you'd only deal with 10% of the problem. That doesn't mean to say that migration isn't an issue that needs to be dealt with, but dealing with migration isn't the answer, by itself isn't the answer. There's another big area, which is, of course, retention of staff um, and the ability for people to be able to provide people with drugs or all the other things that people need in order to be able to work, and, of course, to pay them. And sometimes when you meet African health workers in some countries and you realise they haven't been paid for five months, uh, then you may well wonder, well, why didn't they emigrate? Um, and that's a real issue. And, of course, there are family pressures and so on. There are push factors for emigration as well. But the biggest single underlying issue is that not enough health workers are being trained. If I take the UK, we in the UK train 8,000 doctors a year um, uh, for our population of 60 million. Um, in, in Ethiopia, until two years ago, they were training 100 doctors a year for a much bigger population. They've actually trained uh, uh, 3,500 doctors in the last 35 years. So training, getting more people onto the pitch, is the biggest single issue um, in uh, a lot of these low- and middle-income countries. The next point I want to make, though, is, but what people? What are we talking about? Are we talking about the same sort of skill mix as you might traditionally have seen in the 20th century Britain of doctors, nurses, and, and the various um, specialities and so on? And, and the answer is yes and no, of course. Uh, and what you will discover in a lot of Africa is that people have developed their own staffing structures um, that with a lot of people that tend to get called mid-level workers. And by mid-level workers, we mean clinical officers or or, or sometimes physician's assistants, if you're using an American term. These are people who are technically trained to do specific tasks without being fully qualified through the traditional um, American and European uh, routes. So, for example, in Mozambique, you have 90% uh, plus of the caesareans outside the capital uh, being done by midwife, but being done by um, nurses with an additional, with an additional training um, uh, called Technico de Kirigir. Uh, and their role... Is that, um, is that they deal with all the obstetric complications outside the capital, basically. And they do so, according to 20-year studies, as successfully as physicians do, at half the cost, um, and they stay, whereas the physicians will tend to go off to Brazil or wherever else, uh, or indeed to South Africa. So that issue of skill mix, sometimes called task shifting or task sharing, um, is a really important issue, and it's one, incidentally, which I think we in Europe uh, and America can learn from other people. What can you do about it? Well, the biggest single group that's trying to do anything about this at the moment globally is the Global Health Workforce Alliance, which has been brought together and ho hosted in WHO. It was brought together in response to their, uh, their um, report of 2006. I happen to be one of their global champions, I think the title is, uh, meant to be promoting the importance of human resources as an issue uh, in healthcare and getting, getting a grip on the human resources issues in healthcare. And it set up a whole range of task forces, including one which I chaired with the, uh, the, the, the Commissioner of the African Union, a woman called Beans Gowanus, which was about um, getting the right types of staff, the right groups of staff, the right skill mix of staff uh, in Africa. So they have this really significant role, and if anyone's interested in this, in, the, in this type of topic, then the most important thing to do is to join the Global Health Workforce Alliance, which you'll find, uh, and you'll find that it's free. So that's the very big picture. Massive crisis spreads out across the world, affects us all uh, in our countries, wherever we work. Some really big issues about training and educating more people, some really big issues about skill mix, um, and some really big issues about getting this onto people's agendas. Um, because one of the things that we have observed for a number of years, until probably the last two or three, is that big donors don't want to get involved in human resources issues uh, for the very significant reason that they uh, recognise that it's a long-term commitment. It's not a short fix. This takes a long time. So part of the discussion on the agenda has always been how can we raise the profile of this sort of set of issues. So within all of that, I believe there's a real role for quality improvement, um, and we're about to hear some experience of that, um, in two parts of the world, or I suspect in slightly more than two parts of the world. Uh, so at that note, can I introduce Lauren Kreigler and ask if she will come and uh, talk to us about some more specifics about QI and HR. Thank you very much. Hmm. There don't seem to be any slides here.
Yeah, because this isn't loaded and it's is not. There, is there a box that has your name or somebody's name on it? Ah, whoever. Magic. Good ones? Yep, that's me. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lord Crisp. I'm very happy to be here. And um, what you're going to hear from my presentation is a little bit different, um, although, of course, related to these major HR um, issues that we are suffering throughout the world. Um, I will um, just preface by saying one thing, that although training and educating health workers and bringing them into the system is a major problem um, in all of these countries, one of the other major problems is keeping them there once we have them in. And so when I was challenged with how are we going to apply quality improvement to help human resource issues, I started thinking about sort of what can we do? What can we do at sort of a, a, a micro level, if you will, to really make a change and, and understand um, some of the things that are happening? So this is a story about sort of a much more drilled down example um, in a very poor country in Africa. But to start with, um, let's just sort of think about human resources and how it's supposed to work, and maybe how it works at IBM or somewhere else. Um, policies are made by someone at a desk, and they write them out very clearly, and they distribute them to people. And then managers are supposed to work with their staff and educate them and explain to them how they affect them individually. And that's how it works. And this, of course, works in Africa just like it works in our organizations. But it doesn't. It doesn't work here and it doesn't work there. And generally, this is just a very flawed perception of how human resources works. Really, it affects in a dramatic way how care is delivered um, in these in these countries. So this is an example, um, just an illustration of what we're talking about. So this project takes place in Niger. And as you can see, um, Niger has a 1 in 16, um, one woman in 16 has a lifetime risk of dying um, from maternal mortality. In sub-Saharan Africa, it's 1 out of 22. And in developing countries, it's 1 out of 76. And those are pretty shocking um, percentages or, or rates if you want to look at maternal mortality. And in Human Resources for Health in Tawa, Niger, which is the region that we're talking about, there is one doctor for every 100,000 people. There is one nurse per every 8,000 people and one midwife for um, every 9,000 women of childbearing age. This map, if you would look at it, um, is a picture of Niger, and the central swath of that map is really the Tawa region um, where this work takes place. So when we thought about how do we apply quality improvement to human resources, the first thing that came to me, and from my experience, what I felt was most important, is that we needed to identify what affects health workers most directly. What are the policies, what are the things that affect them in their daily lives and their ability to perform their jobs? And so performance management is um, really the area that I think that is most relevant to how they do their jobs, what will enable them to perform better, and what they need in terms of, of support um, in their daily jobs. And so we developed a collaborative of 16 clinical teams and 11 management teams in this region in Niger. And we took a slice of the health system that re was representing from the regional hospital and the referral hospital all the way down to the, the smallest clinic so that we could have a representative um, view of the health system. And we developed a change package that consisted of these seven objectives, each of these objectives with a certain number of key strategic 
um, key strategies to implement these objectives. And so the, um, the collaborative really focuses on testing changes that will achieve these seven improvement objectives. In addition to those HR improvement objectives, though, the whole purpose behind this is to improve health and to address the maternal mortality and the um, maternal and child care in Niger. And so the, um, the, the Ministry of Health identified key areas that they wanted to focus on in maternal and child health, and we selected indicators from those areas that we would also have teams focusing on in tandem with the HR objectives. These are three of the improvement objectives that they selected in health. So in addition to the HR objectives that we're looking at, um, from clarifying expectations and providing feedback and competency development, they were also focused, however, in the context of maternal child health. And as um, we heard um, um, Lord Crisp say earlier, rates of assisted deliveries, of course, that's one of the key problems in a country is, um, like Niger. So few women deliver in hospitals or health centers. Most of them deliver at home. And so this was definitely one of the things that these teams wanted to focus on, including postpartum hemorrhage and increasing coverage and family planning. So what you see here are the clinical indicators that they selected and what they would measure in addition to tracking their improvement objectives in health, I mean in human resources. And then on the other side, you see the various different slices of the health center from the district hospitals to health centers to, re to the regional refer uh, maternities and how each of them would actually participate in achieving the objectives that were described. So the first part of this is really understanding what goals are. What are the objectives for this collaborative? And so the process they took was a very lengthy and somewhat challenging process of taking objectives from the National Health Plan, which were those clinical objectives that you saw, and bringing them down through the system to the health center itself and finally to the individual so that the individual health worker understood exactly what his and her responsibilities and tasks were that would contribute to achieving those clinical indicators. And as you can see, it's a very challenging kind of a thing to do. Even in private sector, in my background, it's one of the hardest things for organizations to do, is to have an individual understand what their contribution is to that overall goal or objective. It's a very challenging task. So these teams did exactly that. They identified their objectives. They brought them down to the regional level. From the regional level, they took them to the district to each health center, and then um, likewise to maternity, um, sort of regional maternity, um, I'm sorry, referral centers. And then on the, on the other side, if you see, it says regional health management team and district health management team. At the same time, they identified or they realized that without support from management, they would never be able to implement these changes. And so the management teams also identified changes that they would need to implement in order to achieve these objectives. So this is a, a, a photo of one of the QI teams actually doing this um, alignment and process mapping to understand how these objectives really were implicated or, or were relevant to each level of the system. And that diagram at the back, um, you probably can't see very well, but really is a version of this kind of a process map where we're taking each of those objectives and mapping the processes out to achieve those objectives. And whereas in quality improvement, generally, we see, we see a linear process map um, where we're looking at one clinical process. In this instance, you're actually looking at it from the human perspective or from the HR worker perspective. So that you're taking, in this case, a client visit in family planning, but rather than just looking at the process, you're looking at the contribution of each of the individuals to that process and what their roles are. And then from this, teams were able to develop roles and specific objectives and therefore job descriptions for each of these health workers. And so this is kind of an example of what came out of that. As you can see on the left, there's a process map, as messy as it is, that has the health workers on the left, the various different processes that are involved, um, and the resulting performance objectives, both at the global level, which is 100% of patients are 
um, assisted, um, uh, delivered, I'm sorry, I'm translating in French, but um, are 100% of pregnant women are assisted by a qualified provider. And then the specific individual objective, which is under that. And a very proud midwife showing us these. Um. So I'd like to just share some results with you that are really quite striking. This is um, two, um, obviously two indicators that we are tracking. The blue line, the lower line, is the percent of health workers with job descriptions that are, res that are a result of this process that they've gone through. And the upper line is compliance to norms in essential newborn care in five district hospitals. And the convergence of these lines <laughs> is really quite striking um, and very rare to see that this has actually taken place. Um, one of the other major um, indicators that they're looking at is improving contraceptive prevalence, one of the big issues in order to improve maternal mortality. And as you can see here, um, we have the national level, uh, the national um, contraceptive prevalence rate in Niger is about 7%. If you look at the blue line, you'll see some improvement, um, not as great as we might want to see, but I certainly think uh, you know a, a trend that's improving across all the um, collaborative sites. And then one health facility that really took this on as kind of a mission, Wadata, which is a very small facility, that felt that they could do this, this is something that they could actually help achieve by reassigning tasks within the facility so that one of the health workers could reach out to communities and actually bring women in from communities, do the, the right kind of, of communication for change that enabled them to do that um, into the community. One of the other areas um, that we have seen improvement in is efficiency. Um, this is an example from three um, hospitals, in district hospitals, where you see improvement in client weight. Um, the red line is the baseline that we conducted in 2009 when we initiated this work. And the green line is midline that we took in October of last year. And so you can see the major reductions in client wait time, which is also, although it was not an initial focus of this work, is something that is resulting from the process mapping and from the rationalization of tasks and roles um, in these facilities. So this approach we are also applying in several other countries. We are taking lessons learned from Niger, and we are applying them in HIV um, country, uh, country in Tanzania and ART PMTCT facilities. We are also taking this approach and adapting it to the community level and developing community level collaboratives in both Mali, um, in maternal child health, and in Ethiopia to support HIV care. So we're very excited about the fact that this process um, has shown such amazing results and has involved the health workers themselves in trying to solve what is a huge problem um, in human resources. Thank you. All right. Hello, everybody. Uh, let's see. Uh, so thank you all for uh, joining us this afternoon. My name is Kate Armate. Again, I work for the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, as, as Nigel just said earlier. Um, my primary role is as a country director for our South African program. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about <clears throat> what Nigel, uh, Lauren, and I talked about earlier was actually going through some examples of how, in some instances in South Africa, we have used quality improvement as a mechanism of strengthening the health workforce and, and actually seeing how we can actually improve uh, human resources for health, and I'll give you some uh, examples from our work in South Africa. <clears throat> so Nigel uh, has already laid out the, the need here and the problem, so I won't belabor this point, but clearly there's a major shortage of work for, uh, health workers around the world. Uh, this comes from the uh, organization that Nigel is, uh, uh, I think, uh, I don't know what you called it, Nigel, a champion of, or uh, 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 anyway, uh, is a, a key member of. So the Global Health Workforce Alliance, uh, several statistics around kind of what the exact nature of the problem is here that we're dealing with. Um, and what we need here at the end really is some innovation in how we develop solutions to solve and, and fix this problem. 
Um, let's take, let me take you now to South Africa for a moment where I do most of my work. Um, and these are some classifications, obviously, of personnel, and I'll explain them for a second. And then these are estimations uh, that were done by a group from the WHO in 2008 and then updated for mental health issues in 2011. It's a recent article in the last issue of the bulletin uh, of the WHO. The first group is uh, professional nurses, which are sort of the highest level of nursing that's uh, achieved in, in South Africa. And actually, interestingly, in South Africa, the, the nursing population is, is thought to be uh, adequate uh, across the board. There's significant distributional issues, so clear uneven distribution, certain geographies that lack nursing staff and others that are, uh, have significant, uh, don't have as many shortfalls. Uh, but overall, countrywide, uh, it's thought that about 94% of the need is met, um, in, a, in essence, for the nursing staff. Enrolled nurses, however, which is sort of the level one nurse, the one that's just coming out of the uh, training program, uh, is substantially less. So there's a big gap and a potential problem that's emerging in South Africa about that next level. How are we going to get enough nursing staff? Is the pipeline full, in essence, uh, for the future? And the enrolled nurses, significant, a big step off between uh, the existing professional nursing staff, aging professional nursing staff, and the new nurses that are coming into the, to the health workforce. So we may encounter a problem there. Uh, mental health professionals, this is across the board, doctors, nursing, et cetera, uh, at about uh, one-third of the total requirement, about 27% of what is needed. And then, surpri uh, not surprisingly perhaps, but a major shortage of physicians. So if you look at this, uh, if you look at this architecture here, this is all in the public sector now I'm, I'm primarily describing, and that's an important point to make, particularly in the South African context, because obviously the private sector, which does account for uh, about seven to 10, 10 million people uh, of a country of 50 million people uh, is sufficiently staffed with physicians and nurses and may in fact be the reason for some of the shortages that we're seeing on the professional physician staff. So 7% of the total need in the public sector uh, for physicians. So if you look at this, um, this uh, diagram, or sorry, this list of numbers here, the bottleneck here is pretty obvious in terms of uh, where the problem might lie in, in uh, resources and capacity. Interestingly, however, several policies in South Africa are physician-led and physician-driven. So in terms of, uh, until very recently, and I'll show you some uh, description of task shifting and task sharing as uh, Nigel described it, um, I'll show you some uh, about HIV in a moment. But a lot of the HIV treatment policy in South Africa until very recently was driven and led by physicians. You needed a doctor to prescribe antiretroviral, excuse me, antiretroviral treatment for, for patients. So clearly with this kind of situation here, physicians would be a major bottleneck and a problem in that situation. So we asked the question, looking at this um, data, we asked the question, can quality improvement uh, offer anything to help solve this problem? And you know, how can we, what can we do? How can we leverage these existing human resources to do more? Um, and we asked ourselves this question first. So we took a survey of all of our staff. This is people like ourselves who already work within quality and safety, uh, all of our, te our team members in different countries around the world. And we said, do we believe actually intrinsically, what's our theory of change? Do we actually believe as a group of people working on these issues, do we believe that we can use quality improvement to improve the human resources for health problem and address health workforce? And this is what we found, and this may not be that surprising to you all, but we felt that the answer was yes. We believed quite strongly that quality improvement and our methods could actually help human resources for, for health. We asked this around seven, several different domains, about 10 different questions that we asked people to rate quality improvement on. And broadly speaking, our team felt, our groups that were working around uh, Africa and Asia, felt that quality improvement could uh, empower local staff to test solutions, could encourage creativity among uh, other staff members, uh, free worker time uh, to do additional work or other work, um, and uh, give staff a sense of purpose, and make uh, improvement, uh, improvement activity would be exciting and interesting to staff. The second, uh, the second half of the survey, uh, we found that most of our staff believed that we could make improvements. We could actually drive existing improvements. We could, uh, uh, our staff would feel more connected to leadership and would increase engagement, quality improvement would increase engagement of our staff with their work um, and bring them together in team togetherness. However, the final point, there was significant disagreement about, and this is an important point. Very few of us felt that quality improvement methods would actually reduce staff turnover and improve retention of our health workforce. This was our staff 
feeling that we actually couldn't solve the problem of retention, the major issue that, that Lauren was referring to earlier. We asked the same questions of some of our teams in the field, and the responses that we've received so far, they're not, our survey is not complete, but the responses that we've received so far, interviewing clinic staff uh, in the public sector in India, uh, South Africa, um, uh, Ghana, and Malawi, has so far indicated broad convergence on some of these things, perhaps a little bit less enthusiasm for quality improvement as the answer to human resources problems, but very significantly uh, a, a disbelief that QI could actually solve the worker retention issue. Um, so exactly how, so we, we went into this saying, okay, we believe actually significantly that quality improvement can help the human resources for health problem. Uh, how? You know, what, in, the, in the rest of the theory of change here, what's the mechanism in some senses that, that QI can actually help with this problem? And Lauren showed us some examples of, of this work from Niger, and I'm going to go into a few examples from South Africa. So these were some of the domains in which we thought that uh, quality improvement work could actually solve some of these problems around health workforce. We believe that uh, a lot of what we did was reducing rework and duplication. So how do we maximize existing human resources? Uh, through this process of reducing rework, duplication, removing waste, simplifying processes of care to make things easier for existing uh, workforce and improving productivity. And then taking what we have and using it better, taking the existing resources that are in the system and using them more efficiently. In, in, in the example that I'll give you around task shifting and task sharing, using nurses and counselors and, and, and not just sending everything to the bottleneck, the physicians in the South African context. Down referrals, another mechanism for targeting resources more uh, efficiently. And then final point here, which is really more anecdotal and there's not a lot of data to support this yet, uh, which is that we believed quality improvements sincerely improve staff morale. And a lot of our staff that's working on quality improvement projects around the world, and I, I suspect that the HCI team might feel similarly to, to us about this, actually believe that fundamentally quality improvement brings a different spirit and energy to the health workforce in a way that almost nothing else uh, or a few other things do. So a few examples of, of, of what I mean by some of those things. Reducing rework and duplication. And I, I have to say, a lot of our effort in South Africa is connected to HIV. So most of the examples I'm going to give you uh, over the next uh, few minutes here are all connected to the uh, HIV crisis in South Africa because it is uh, the biggest health problem um, in the country. So one of the ways in which our teams straight away started working on this, and there's several people I can see scattered in the room who have been working with us in these problems, uh, in Cape Town, Durban, and Johannesburg, we started bundling CD4 testing, a key laboratory test in the first stages of your HIV infection, with the actual initial HIV test. Previous to that, women, men, whoever, when they received an HIV test for the first time, would be sent home, had to wait till they tested positive or negative. If they tested positive, come back again and receive a CD4 count. Rather than doing that and missing the opportunity uh, for, for testing, we bundle the CD4 test with the HIV test. And if the test was positive, we'd discard the, uh, uh, or sorry, put the CD4 test across for, 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 uh, to the laboratory. We combined uh, adherence classes. Throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, there's lots of adherence training, and there's, uh, it's almost established itself as, an, it's, it was meant uh, with good intentions to strengthen patients' abilities to understand uh, their medications and ensure that they would remain adherent to those medicines uh, for the long run. Uh, <clears throat> however, the way that these literacy or adherence training classes uh, were structured was that they sent patients home, back and forth to home and back, several times in the months, sometimes weeks, uh, prior to being initiated on antiretroviral therapy. So rather than sending patients home and, and introducing additional steps, we combined things like literacy one and two, combined these adherence training courses um, so that we could get patients onto therapy faster. Fast tracking and ensuring that patients were, were being tested and treated uh, decreased the fifth point on this, which is actually a bit of a duplication on my duplication slide, uh, decreased the loss to follow-up and retesting um, uh, of patients that were initially tested, went home, the test result was lost, and they came back again and were retested. Deleting duplicate registers, uh, I'll show you an example of that in a moment, but in many places we reduced the number of times patients' names, the administrative data that, patient, that was collected on patients uh, from being collected in one instance 11 times in 11 separate registers, name, address, and uh, the date. We reduced that to two or three times during the course of a, a, a visit to a clinic. 
Um, and then finally, there's an example or story from Cape Town of how patients uh, were idiosyncratically having their pills packed. And this is uh, if a patient comes and says, I have a certain regimen, there are several standard regimens that are in place in sub-Saharan Africa. And so rather than sort of every time a patient comes to your window, hand, you know, going aside and packing the pills yourself, uh, we used the standard regimen and created prepackaged medicine uh, uh, pills, anticipating who was going to come on that day and, and knowing what their regimen was and being able to sort of hand them the medicines that were already prepacked and saving time um, and, and work in that instance. Here's an example of the register situation. This is steps in a uh, 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 prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV program in one district. Uh, several steps in the process, uh, several registers in the process. One, two, uh, there's seven registers in this particular one uh, that were converging separately onto the district health information system in this instance. And what we did in this situation we, is we redesigned the data collection process, reduced the number from seven uh, to four, which then went into the uh, DHIS directly. And this is just literally the example of what that cohort register uh, looked like in this instance. But by doing so, we reduced duplication, the number of times data was collected, and also in the process reduced error, which was an important sort of piece of this as well. Removing waste, I'm actually going to step outside of South Africa and, and go to Haiti for a moment, where post-earthquake there's been a tremendous amount of work that's being done around HIV as well as syphilis care to not interrupt uh, treatment practice and, and, uh, and flow uh, as a result of natural disaster. And in this instance, before the earthquake, interestingly enough, uh, there was these very long chains of how patients would flow through clinics um, in some of the places that they were working in in Haiti. And as a result of the earthquake, in a, in a, in a somewhat perverse way, there is an incentive now to speed the process of how patients are processed um, in, 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 in Haiti. And by doing so, they discovered opportunities where there was tremendous amount of waste in the, in the system. And, and, and by doing so, they've simplified their processes and created a, a much more standard workflow in this instance, reducing the number of steps uh, uh, and, and shortening the duration that it takes a patient to go through a clinic and removing waste from the system. Another example of uh, wasted opportunity um, that affects the workforce is when mothers and babies uh, who are uh, a baby born to an HIV positive mother uh, come to the clinic and have to go to separate parts of the clinic. You're duplicating labor in that potential uh, particular encounter. And so one intervention that was simply done in Cape Town was actually to take the, the, two, different, um, the two different information sources, the mother's uh, road to health card and the antenatal patient, uh, sorry, the baby's road to health card and the mother's antenatal card, and stapling them together and creating a single patient record that involved both mother and baby so that both of them could be addressed at the same clinic appointment at subsequent times that they came to the clinic, al allowing a single health worker uh, to sort of dual process two patients um, at the same time. Obviously, mothers and babies have different clinical needs at times, and so if there was a specific problem or issue that required the attention of a specialized service provider, then they could be separated and sent there. But the vast majority are healthy and well and could be addressed together. So a simple opportunity, again, to save two people's staff time and condense it into one visit. <clears throat> Excuse me. Another sort of core mechanism that we used, uh, that we used throughout South Africa to help to help us save uh, the precious human resource that we, that we have is to simplify complex processes of care into simple steps. You heard some of you were here yesterday when you heard Atul Gawande talk about the checklist and how they created simple, they took very complex processes, heterogeneous processes that were happening in ORs around the world and looked for the core important processes that were necessary and created pause points and checklists around those pause points. This is essentially what we did with PMTCT as well, the prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. We found that when we looked at the complex processes that were occurring around PMTCT and the number of human resources that were being invested at different steps along the way, we could simplify that process into five essential steps, create pause points around them, and allocate or predetermine what types of human resources were necessary at each step along the way. And by doing so, could plan better and use what we had available to us more efficiently and effectively. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. In this uh, slide, there's two kind of uh, pieces around how to target resources more efficiently. So when you have uh, a specialized service um, and you want to use it um, maximally, 
one method of doing that, a, a precious resource, especially a, a specialized care service like a hospital or otherwise, we found when we were looking at how patients were being treated for HIV or initiated on, on therapy for HIV, that all of it was happening at the hospital, a specialized center. And one mechanism of dealing with that and using that resource or freeing that resource rather for where, uh, for instances in which it was necessary was to down refer or move patients out of that specialized resource to primary care clinics uh, where they could be addressed more routine. If the care was routine, they could be addressed and initiated um, at those routine uh, sites where there was more capacity. So again, targeting your resources more effectively using down referral so when you have a precious resource at a hospital, it can be used as needed, whereas your primary care clinics can do the bulk of the work if patients are well enough to be done. Uh, task shifting is an interesting strategy. Just a few pieces of data here from the literature um, in South Africa. Um, we know that in terms of sort of important areas in which we, we, we can, uh, how does task shifting work or what does it help us with? It improves access. We, we know this from work that's done in the Eastern Cape in Lusiki Siki, where we've seen that uh, by using nurses to initiate patients on HIV therapy, uh, we can actually reduce the waiting time that patients usually uh, spend uh, awaiting being initiated on heart. Uh, in two years, they wiped out the backlog of patients that were waiting for heart uh, in one district in the Eastern Cape. We also know in terms of cost, and one of the themes of the conference is around saving money, um, and I think this is an important point. Doctors cost a significant portion of most of our clinic's budgets, and by doing the shifting, the task shifting that we're doing, we use those doctors more effectively for non-HIV-related care and other things that are important. Quality is a concern, was a concern, I should say, in South Africa when they did the task shifting work and shifted the burden of responsibility for taking care of patients with HIV to nurses. There was really uh, quite serious uh, concern. Um, however, there's been several trials that have, done, uh, that have been done over the last couple of years that show that nurses manage HIV care uh, just as well as physicians do. There's not inferior, NIMARD is the word that uh, South Africans use uh, to describe nurse initiative. Excuse me. Nurse initiation, initiation and management of antiretroviral therapy, and that's been proven to be non-inferior. Nurses managing care. Uh, the, finally, there's also some evidence to suggest that loss to follow-up rates in nursing-driven programs are actually lower than doctor-driven programs. So not only might we be getting more for our money in some sense, but we might also be getting better for our money um, in some sense. Uh, and finally, there's an indication, at least from the recent literature, that task shifting and uh, might in fact have other benefits to nurse uh, to the nursing workforce. It might actually increase job satisfaction of nursing staff and lower the usage of sick leave in this particular study uh, in 2008 and lower the perceived workload, um, quite interestingly. Um, and in South Africa, this program has, has now uh, spread throughout the country. It's called the STRETCH program for stretching the resources. In essence, uh, the acronym means something else, but in essence, stretching resources from the nursing staff into uh, doing other initiation work. And these are a few graphs from a particular outpatient department showing how task shifting really did in, fra did in fact increase the capacity of the system to deliver HIV care to more and more patients over the period in question. As far as improved stories of morale, uh, staff morale, I mentioned to you that these are, this remains anecdotal at this stage, and we're hoping to capture this information in, in, in the next uh, uh, phase of our work. But we believe that staff morale is improved because it makes sense. Uh, the quality improvement approach establishes clear common aims and goals and a framework for uh, engaging local staff to actually change practice. So it, it makes sense. You're paying attention to what the lo local staff are doing and wanting to change. The all teach and all learn approach, allowing uh, anybody to create ideas for how a system would move and, 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 and shift. Um, and, and you know the whole notion of celebration as a, as a mechanism, actually, of improving uh, capability of the system, uh, I think really all sort of adds up anecdotally to a, a, a suggestion that we would improve staff morale. And certainly there are um, several quotes from people that we've gotten uh, about how uh, staff morale has been improved. Um, I'll just read the one, the, the first one there. Yesterday was one of the best days of my career. Uh, it showed the impact that quality improvement can bring, and I'm excited. It's great to be part of the team. Um, finally, I'll just conclude with a few questions uh, that I think deserve further investigation, and perhaps uh, we can talk a little bit about these in whatever time we have left. But I think that there's a question around, uh, still that remains here, around whether we can prove that quality improvement improves 
the satisfaction of staff, and to what degree does it do that, and for how long is that effect sustained? Uh, there are, I think, some pretty important questions around whether quality improvement can uh, improve productivity of staff. And as measured, I think in some, uh, there's different ways of measuring productivity, but I think we've been talking increasingly as, about it as measuring productivity as outputs per unit staff member. And then finally, uh, I think a really important question here about whether or not quality improvement can have any effect on that very crucial problem that we talked about it right at the beginning here, about whether we can actually change the way that people move um, and keep crucial health resources um, in place for the future. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, um, both Kedar and Lauren, for those really fascinating examples, very practical examples, affecting um, human resources management um, and retention and, uh, and, and all of them focused on actually delivering improving care, improvements in care. What I said at the beginning is, and we've got sort of about 12 minutes, something like that, uh, was that actually this might be a moment for people to uh, make a few comments about your experience and your ideas about how quality improvement and human resources issues interact, whether you've got particular examples you'd like to tell us about, and that more of a sort of sharing, because this is a, a field where I think there is a lot developing rather than a lot already established, uh, and so it'd be interesting to get any examples from anybody in the room who'd like to, to, who'd like to comment. I think I'm going to have to pass this microphone around by the look of it and say who you are, if you I'm Lachlan Farrow from uh, uh, Boston, also president of the Albert Schweitzer Hospital in Africa. Sort of a general, general framework, I think that the solution, like for almost everything in the world's problems, is engaging young people. Uh, there's exponential growth of young Americans in health professions wanting to work globally. Um, uh, the greatest satisfaction they often have is connecting with young people in Africa and other places. I suspect young people in Africa love connecting with young people. The most energetic group, with all due respect to the older ones uh, uh, here like me uh, that I found here at this meeting, are the young people with the open school and all that. Are there any systematic efforts or any concrete efforts in other places about mobilizing young people? They know how to connect with every other young person in the world today. Thanks for that, Lachlan. That, what, should we collect a few of these, and then I'll ask my colleagues to, to make wise comments in response. Um, who else would like to give us a thought? Thank you. Yes, thank you very much for the presentations. My name is Marion Lisa, and I'm working in Tanzania with the Christian Social Services Commission, which is actually responsible for providing about 50% of the health services of the country. And uh, we are also working on one uh, human resources for health project uh, since a few months. And uh, the workforce needed in the country is about 130,000 and available are about 40,000. Just to get back to some of the figures and to describe the concrete gap in our working situation. So uh, we presume by looking into the uh, figures of the output of the health training institutions that actually there must be dormant workforce. We do not think that all the health workers who were trained actually left the countries and it's such a brain drain from Tanzania at least. So the question is, and we really would love to do some research on it, but we haven't found any source to, to finance that, to find out actually why is it probably more attractive to sell five tomatoes in the kiosk next door than actually providing health services. And so far the packages of payment and the shifts and all that were not overly attractive and they won't be for a long time. But still there must be possibilities to bring that workforce back. And one of the uh, points actually were quality, quality of services in the facilities themselves so the people can start being proud of it. So that was one thing which was very often um, mentioned. And we would love to, to know more about that in our Tanzanian situation, but maybe you know more uh, already, and I would love to hear that. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed for that. Um, who else would like to make a comment? Or Thank you.
Thank you. Um, Robert Tiagalide, I work with uh, the Healthcare Improvement Projects in Uganda. Uh, two questions. One is more like a comment. Uh, last year we did, with Edward, um, we did an assessment of uh, a cost-effective analysis of uh, a collaborative which was working on improving use of records and, and uh, efficiency of HIV clinics using quality improvement approaches. And then uh, when we did the uh, cost-effectiveness of that showed uh, a lot of time is being freed up if they apply QI approaches. And that time uh, which is freed up per uh, facility or even per health worker if the changes are rolled out to the rest of the country to be equivalent to hiring an additional 300 plus staff. So, you know, there's a whole write-up of that, but it's an indicator of part of the questions that Keda asked that uh, quality improvement actually contributes to uh, addressing gaps in, in human resource. So, you know, that's a bit of literature we could share. The second question is, uh, you went to South Africa and, and they had all these so many tools that they use for monitoring patients. The same exact situation that happens in Uganda. The Minister of Health has like 10 different registers. Then uh, different partners come with different registers and you know everyone has to use them. So you succeeded in um, having those revised or narrowed down to you know, a few. We've tried efforts on that and it's not really working out very well. How did you get people to buy into reducing registers to you know, address the fact that human resources are required to fill them in and that human resource is not available? Great. Thank you very much indeed. Can we manage one or even two more before I hand back to my colleagues? Anyone at the back before I go to the front? Right. I'll go to the front then, I think. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for the very important and a very interesting lecture. And um, it's really a shame and really embarrassing that I didn't know about this fact so deeply. And um, I have a two question. One is how um, the physicians, uh, I'm a physician, and how as a physician can involve those activities. Um, not only the donations, but also, and also, you know, everyone couldn't go physically to help those uh, issues, but how we could involve in those activities. And second is how we could um, improve the awareness of these issues within the healthcare providers in, in the whole world. Very good, thank you. Any last comment or question before I hand to my colleagues. Okay, I think uh, we've got about two minutes each, so who'd like to go first? Uh, sure. Uh, so uh, several different uh, questions. On the, on the issue of uh, young people and getting people involved in uh, global health, there's a, there's a significantly different, there's several different, I think, initiatives that are going on. I know there's an important new one that uh, I think is being launched out of the Boston at Massachusetts General Hospital and through Vanessa Carey's work, uh, John, Senator John Kerry's daughter, uh, that's around a global, in essence, a global public health core, trying to develop a global public health core that might uh, sort of inspire young people to join that core and work in Africa and other places and actually provide some level of human resourcing, if not at least temporarily, uh, to different places in the world. Similar to the Peace Corps, I guess, but specifically oriented towards global health and specifically at a level of service that's uh, uh, a little bit higher up in, in the physician level or nursing. Uh, <clears throat> Um, on the issue of uh, cost effectiveness and freeing up time, I think that that, meant that uh, bit that you mentioned, Robert, I think is, is really interesting. And I think the way that you quantify that um, is quite interesting. And I'd be uh, very interested to learn more about how you did that. In other words, uh, quantifying the amount of time that was saved by virtue of the quality improvement initiatives that you had uh, put in place. Uh, and, and equating that to the number of people that you think that actually ended up replacing uh, as a result of that, I think that would be very interesting analysis that would potentially be uh, important for us to, to look at in terms of your methodology because I think my question is, has been how do we actually quantify the productivity uh, time that we're, we're saving here. Uh, on the question that you asked about how do we actually manage to decrease the number of registers, that's a very important question. As somebody, I can't remember which session I was in yesterday, but somebody mentioned the idea that um, <clears throat> nursing staff at this stage are actually treating 
register books rather than treating people in many places in the world, which is a, a scary and, and uh, frightening future, or at least current status. So uh, the, the, your question of how do we actually manage to do this was really by doing it. I, there's, I, I can't, there's no magic to this in some ways, but we actually went to these clinics and, and started asking why they were filling out the same information five or six or seven times. And in many instances, they were simply not aware that they were filling it out five, six, seven times. And so by, by pointing that out and starting to, to find the opportunities through process mapping and all the usual stuff that we do in quality improvement, we, we managed to find those opportunities for consolidating uh, steps, for putting things together, simplifying processes, finding pause points, and, and actually removing things that were unnecessary or extraneous in those instances. So in, in point of fact, the way that we did it was not through uh, uh, a policy level or a higher level kind of uh, work, but rather at the point of service, and then uh, slowly but surely made the case to the provincial Department of Health by virtue of having eliminated about six or seven different registers from most of the clinics where we were working. And once you generate sufficient uh, quantity there, I think you can you can uh, uh, persuade people to do that. Thanks, Kayla. Um, thank you. Um, I guess I was just going to sort of add to what. Um, Kedar was just describing in Tanzania, I think one of the keys that we've learned in Niger, I mean in Uganda, one of the keys that we've learned in Niger is um, I think one of our keys to success there was was the alignment of goals and the, def the definition of specific objectives that health workers themselves actually worked through. And so by them, I mean you've heard Kedar describe sort of the motivation and the engagement of health workers when they're actually involved in problem solving. So often if you pose these qu questions directly to them and you show them the data or even they collect the data and they work through these issues, that they will come up with these solutions on their own and they seem to stick that way um, when that's the pro process. Um, to, to respond to the, to, to, to the question about Tanzania or, or the, the issue of Tanzania, I think one of the things that we've learned as well is that when you look at human resources, um, most of the people in this room I think are probably um, healthcare professionals and not HR professionals. And I think the, the prism is a little different. Um, your healthcare prof professionals and or quality improvement professionals. But there aren't a lot of HR professionals that end up in this field. And so I think one of the things that's very important is from the HR perspective, all of this process mapping and all of this redesign, even though it's part of our QI process, the result needs to be in a, a comprehensive and um, um, uh, holistic way of looking at the worker and the performer and realizing that he not only needs or she not only needs these specified objectives but they need feedback and they need support and they need um, recognition and they need all of these things that are part of a package. And so one of the things that I think has been so successful as well and one of the reasons that I think Tanzania is having a hard time retaining or bringing back their staff into the process is that they have improved um, their salary packages. They have created more benefit packages, but they aren't working to bring people in because they really haven't addressed some of the other issues that are underlying causes for unhappy or, or, or unmotivated staff at facilities and places like that. Um, so I think that it's, it's an, um, so often we fail because we're looking at it from a very vertical or very um, a mono, you know, monocled kind of a view instead of looking at holistic from the person that's actually doing the work. Um, and then as physicians, how, you know, from sort of the developed world or from other environments, how, how can we help? Um, and I think part of it is these, the, these organizations and these communication mechanisms. Um, you know, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I don't know that I've ever heard anyone ask that question in a session. So I'd be interested in somebody else's answer to that. We're, we're absolutely on time. Let, let, let me just uh, make two comments um, from my experience, actually. One is about the Tanzanian example. We had exactly that issue in the UK when we were trying to increase, funny enough, we were trying to increase expenditure as well as growth in the service in 2000. And we knew there were a lot of nurses out there who weren't working. 
And we had to do precisely what Lauren was talking about. We had a back to... Because a lot of people went up, and particularly women went, obviously went and had children and then didn't come back. So we had to identify why they didn't come back. And it was some of the obvious things, but it was also some less obvious things, including some of the cultural things and about what shifts they were able to work. So we treated it as a really focused programme to find out why they were out there uh, and then brought them back. And I think there's maybe a bit of experience that... That, that, that people can share around that. Let me go to this last point, actually, which is about how does a busy physician in China um, both uh, spread the word about the problem but also help? Um, and one of the things that, again, we've done in, in the UK for some years is have these partnership programmes between areas in the UK and areas in Africa or indeed in, in India, which would be links between hospitals. And a typical one, for example, will be that, i just take one, between Oxford and a place in, um, and KCMC in uh, Tanzania, actually, um, where every year a few people from Oxford go and work for a week or two on training issues, on helping people to use ultrasound, on, not on pre-service training, but on in-service training. Um, at the request of the Tanzanians, they say which people they'd like to come. And sometimes they want the hospital engineer, because actually they're interested in clean water more than they are interested in interventional radiologist. Uh, and then at another time of the year, some people from Tanzania go back the other way. And it's all funded by the, the Brits, by fundraising or whatever. Now, there's quite a lot of those mechanisms, and sometimes it doesn't have to uh, involve... Um, actual people going, because the more that you've got electronic means, the more there are means of supporting people across the world. And one of the things I, that, that I observe amongst health professionals is that health professionals love working with each other. You know, The docs do like to be part of a wider uh, uh, fraternity or sorority of, of doctors and the nurses and so on. Uh, and so there's a real solidarity issue to build on, which uh, you know I hope that you will now initiate in China. <laughs> Oh, sorry, I thought you said China. <laughs> Forgive me. <laughs> well, on that unfortunate note, and my apologies, thank you all for attending the meeting. <laughs>